Now, the latest on the Ebola outbreak. West Africa, the World Health Organization calls it an extraordinary event. The most severe Ebola outbreak in the The disease has struck hard in three countries. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. Here are some of the media stories we've been tracking this week. Sorting the science out from the scare tactics, we examine the Ebola stories coming out of Africa. Take a close look at some of those op-eds on governments with image problems. PR companies are lurking behind those headlines. Journalists in Egypt, it's not just what they say in print or on the air. Now they have to watch what they say over coffee. And pent-up beats on an old-school desktop. Ebola, as viruses go, it's a difficult one to contain. As news stories go, difficult to cover. The first rumblings of an outbreak came back in March in the West African country of Guinea. When cases were reported in neighboring Liberia and Sierra Leone, the media were hooked. And by the time the virus traveled beyond Africa's borders, the international media went into overdrive. For journalists traveling into the hot zone, taking the necessary precautions is job one. Then they have to get the medical science right, the epidemiology, to avoid the kind of fear-mongering the media are sometimes known for. On the ground in the afflicted countries in West Africa, reporters have struggled with access, and there have been reports of police harassment, arrests, and the closure of one Liberian newspaper deemed to be off-message. At the international level, some news organizations have shown a tendency to rely on Western, mostly white faces, to tell a story that couldn't be much more African. Our starting point this week is the capital of Liberia, Monrovia, where journalists from around the world are trying to get the Ebola story right. When this thing started, our reporters were gambling on how to report the story. The coverage on Ebola thus far has run the gamut from more sensational to more complex. Initially, it was like Ebola, you get it, you die. Over time, the messaging has been reorganized to project the reality. Something that's been very interesting is how little of that coverage discusses things from an African perspective. Assignment Liberia. The story, Ebola. The challenge for correspondent Laura Logan of CBS News and its 60 Minutes program is to get in and out and report the story to Americans back home without becoming a statistic, a casualty of the outbreak. The piece made news. Twitter took notice, not because of what was in the report, but what was not. The interviewees, all five of them, were Americans. In 15 minutes and 12 seconds of television, Logan and her producers somehow did not speak to a single Liberian. The Africans were seen and not heard. Extras in CBS's All-American Movie. It's almost as if she's sort of going through this, this foreign land, almost like a travel documentary, and not actually talking to anyone. In one of the scenes, she's talking about all the protective gear that the doctors have to wear. And they're talking about the, the local physicians, the actual Liberians themselves that are manning this hospital, uh, and talking about how difficult the suit is. And then instead of talking to one of those doctors, how tough is it to wear that suit? Physically? Yeah. It's astounding. She turns to the American doctor that's with her uh, and, and gets it from his perspective. The CBS piece really is, is almost sort of a, we're here to document how America and, and the West is saving Africa. Logan's uh, report is a classic example of the white savior complex and that narrative being perpetuated in the international press by focusing on American doctors Congolese doctors, people from the DRC, have contained this disease multiple times. They're the ones who should be on the Al Jazeera's and the New York Times and the, you know, the Guardians and the CNNs because they've done this. This is not their first attempt at containing Ebola. They are in Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone, but again, they're doing the hard work. They're putting out the fires, and therefore, the international press doesn't necessarily validate their experience. CBS defended its journalism, telling the Listening Post, we're proud of our story about Ebola victims in Liberia and their volunteer American caretakers, whose descriptions of those suffering from the virus and their efforts to comfort them made millions of 60 Minutes viewers feel the plight of Africans at the epicenter of this deadly disease. It is not uncommon for the international media to go to a hotspot and then find some of their own people to interview. It's a way to get audiences back home to connect to the story. 
French media did some of that in West Africa, as did the British. I'm a British doctor. But to exclude local voices from such a lengthy report as CBS did is extraordinary. The British media, to a large extent, you know, were uh, sensible as to the way they report on Ebola. I think it was Channel 4. They had somebody who actually went to a village and actually tried to understand how the community, are they managing all this? Because, you know, that's what the people are saying. One person's dead there. And the international media slowly are now giving access to those sort of people for their stories to be had. So I think it's changing. For all of the challenges the international media face on the Ebola story, unfamiliar terrain, the precautionary protocols, they do enjoy distinct advantages over local reporters, starting with the journalistic basics, access. When the foreign press comes here, they get access to the diplomatic corps. The American ambassador will talk to them freely especially if it's an American organization. They have to go to MSF, they'll be given free access, then they get access that we don't have. So you have to fight your way through. Either you know somebody who knows somebody, and then you get the access to somewhere. But it's difficult in the, being in a position where you can actually do the work you want to do when the foreign journalists are at an advantage to you. It's a known fact that the government will easily respect the journalists because they come from Al Jazeera or Fox News or CNN. We're taking you inside an Ebola isolation unit in rural Africa. As opposed to somebody coming from the inquiry and newspaper making some demands. We think that's not very fair, that's not proper. But at the same time, the very government will want to complain that uh, the journalists have been, have been too intrusive, which is, uh, should not be. The governments of Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia have all declared states of emergency. Liberia's has since been rescinded, and some journalists say the situation has been used to suppress the reporting of the story. In Sierra Leone, a popular radio host, David Tambario, was taken off the air and arrested after questioning the government's response to the outbreak. In Liberia, the editor of the National Chronicle newspaper was also arrested. His paper shut down just hours after the government there warned journalists over critical reporting during the Ebola emergency. That's been the tussle between the media and, and many governments. And it hasn't been handled in the right way, both by the governments and by the media. And I think there needs to be much more of a diplomatic approach where the media takes its responsibility seriously at a heightened level and governments also recognize that the media can be used as a tool to contain the disease. And if you have that kind of environment where the message is not being disseminated properly, it becomes a problem because um, the whole idea about Ebola is about creating awareness, making sure that things are, the stories are told properly so people can be in the right position to explain themselves and to get themselves ready. But if you have a situation where the media is not properly supported, it becomes a problem. A Ebola situation to not be, should not be used as a situation to suppress media. That has been, that has been clear in Liberia, that is very clear in Sierra Leone, and that has also been the case in, in, in Guinea. And I think that is just bad, because when you start restraining journalists, arresting them because they are talking a story, you allow denial to keep creeping in. And the greater the denial, the worse the situation, because denial has been the worst culprit in spreading Ebola in our country. So the easier way to do it is to allow media to be free. And at the end of the day, we will all have a hand in stopping Ebola once and for all. On the download this week, some of our viewers weigh in on the coverage of the Ebola story. The main difference between European media and US media in the coverage of the Ebola outbreak is that the European media, to a great extent, actually try to mediate some sense of calm, while the US media builds on this notion of fear, which means that it doesn't really generate a public opinion and it also contributes to rumors being spread online. We're always open to viewer feedback and ideas. If you've got an opinion on the news media, just go to our Facebook or our Twitter page. Our Twitter handle is at AJ Listening Post. Fire up your camera, make a worthwhile point on the media, hit send, 
and we'll see you on the download. Other media stories that are on our radar here at The Listening Post, picking up on our lead story from last week on the shifting media landscape in Russia, there are more changes coming. CNN International will reportedly stop broadcasting in the country effective December 31st. That's according to a letter published by the state-owned news agency TASS, in which CNN's parent company, Turner Broadcasting Systems, reportedly notified Russian cable operators of its decision. That followed the passing of a bill that President Vladimir Putin signed into law this past July, which mandates that all pay TV channels in Russia must be ad-free by January 1st, 2015. The law will affect the bottom lines of many private networks which say that revenues generated from subscriptions alone will not be enough to keep them in the black. On the print side in Russia, Mikhail Mikhailin, the editor-in-chief of a leading broadsheet newspaper, Kommersant, has resigned following a threat from an oil company, Rosneft, to sue the newspaper for reporting that the company was pressuring the Kremlin to impose sanctions against the West. Russia's media are now an export industry, but the state-owned news network RT, which has just launched a specialty channel for UK audiences, is apparently in trouble with the British broadcasting regulator Ofcom. Ofcom is investigating RT for a lack of what it calls impartiality in its reporting earlier this year on the story in Ukraine. Egypt's declining freedom of expression may have hit a new low this past week when journalists learned that what they say to each other over coffee can now land them in police custody. The incident took place on November 11th in a Cairo cafe. A French journalist, the editor-in-chief of Le Monde Diplomatique, Alain Gresh, was discussing politics with Egyptian journalists Sarah Korshid and her sister, a student blogger named Reem. Somebody overheard them, alerted the police, and the three were detained and questioned for two hours before being released. Gresh later played down what happened on Twitter, saying that there are many other cases of political prisoners and detained journalists in Egypt. Three of our colleagues at Al Jazeera English, Mohammed Fahmi, Bahar Mohammed, and Peter Gresta, have all been in jail for more than 320 days now. And Egypt has a new law in the pipeline that will not help. The law intends to ban publication of any news, information, statistics, statements, or documents related to the armed forces. A draft of the bill has not been officially released. However, the text was leaked to local media and appeared in the pro-government newspaper. El Watan. The Associated Press has a bone to pick with the FBI over one of the agency's undercover operations in which an agent posed as an AP reporter and concocted a fake AP news report in pursuit of a suspect. This story goes back to 2007, but the details were only revealed recently by the American Civil Liberties Union. The AP has since sent a letter to the FBI complaining that the FBI both misappropriated the trusted name of the Associated Press and created a situation where our credibility could have been undermined on a larger scale. The New York Times then published an editorial referring to a number of FBI cases, including the AP one, arguing that the tactics used, if not prohibited by the agency or blocked by courts, risk opening the door to constitutional abuses on a much wider scale. The FBI's director, James Comey, replied to the Times and did not come close to apologizing. He maintained that what the FBI did in 2007 was legal then, and although it would now require higher clearance, would be legal today. The AP might be starting to take this kind of thing personally. Last year, the U.S. Justice Department swept up phone records of AP reporters and news editors as part of a national security investigation. The Kremlin has worked for eight years with a New York public relations firm called Ketchum. The former government of Ukraine hired a Washington-based company called Venable. And the Bahrainis also went to D.C. for some help from a PR outfit that's called Policy Impact Communications. From placing op-eds in newspapers to recruiting analysts and writers to managing social media accounts for governments, PR firms are hidden behind more bylines and Twitter handles than you realize. State propaganda is nothing new, but in the era of 24-hour news, governments have to work much harder to promote and protect their brands. And they will always have a bunch of Western PR firms vying for that business. The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi now on the relationship between PR companies and governments that need their help and how they use the media to do their work. September 11, 2013. 
The debate in Washington is about Syria and whether the Obama administration should intervene and launch airstrikes at President Assad's forces. The New York Times publishes an op-ed piece. It makes headlines because the byline belongs to the Assad government's most powerful ally, Russian President Vladimir Putin. The piece was arranged by a middleman, an American public relations firm hired by the Kremlin. That op-ed came at a time when uh, the debate over Syria policy and was really raging. You were also hearing a lot of criticism by American politicians and in the media of Russian policy in Syria uh, supporting Assad. Putin is saying to Assad, like, look, buddy, <laughs> I can save you from going to the criminal court. So I think what the Russian government wanted was to speak to the American audience or this sort of elite New York Times reading audience uh, directly in a way that was not filtered through either the Obama administration or uh, the American media's spin on, on the Russia's policy. This article evoked a massive response. If you are Putin, this is a great way to communicate your point to a, to a wider audience. If he was writing for a Russian newspaper, he's confining himself to the converted, who nobody wants to say. Here was an opportunity to talk to a much wider audience. It seems to me to be good uh, that um, leaders are prepared to discuss what they're doing, to put their own case. They may well be lying, but that's not the point. The point is they're putting their case to, to the public. And the reason they do that is because today all diplomacy is public diplomacy. In June this year, Nigerian President Goodluck Jonathan faced a different kind of challenge. The armed group Boko Haram had held more than 200 schoolgirls hostage for two months. Jonathan's government was facing a critical barrage over its handling of the issue, and there was an election coming. Rather than directly targeting the Nigerian media, the government took a roundabout route to deliver its message to its domestic audience, again through a PR company in DC and an op-ed piece in the Washington Post. They were panicking because of the period we're in. A few months of the election, and they want to be seen to be doing something. It's good for them to try to handle the external audience. But there was nothing in the article that Nigerians had not heard before. It wasn't th thought through. And I can sit down here and tell you that contract is not going to be renewed. Once after the election is gone, that's the end of it. He will not be asking anybody to go garnish his image in Washington Post or wherever. And if you think of the governments which need to promote their brand, Nigeria or Iran or China or Russia, we're often talking about regimes which are not very open. And they're not very good at communicating. Therefore, they need somebody who would package that in a manner which would interest a particular newspaper, especially in the West, New York Times, Washington Post, Bloomberg, Economist, CNN, etc. These are elite media. So, and these are run by professional journalists. So the role of the political PR machinery is to turn that information around in a manner which would be acceptable to a professional journalist. These people have sort of invaluable um, personal networks. They know how the editorial process works. They probably know a lot of current working journalists. So if you're a foreign official and you want to get an op-ed placed in a, an American newspaper, or you even just want to get a quote in an article about your story, um, again, it's worth it for you to pay whatever it is, maybe $50,000 a month is sort of a typical uh, fee you see to have this person on retainer. The most important aspect of what a PR agency brings to the table is an external perspective. We are more able to give them a, an audit on their perceptions rather than they themselves would be able to arrive because we work with so many different clients and different governments, we have the expertise and the experience and the relationships with the media that they wouldn't necessarily have in-house. All of that is above board. But then there are the dark arts of the PR game, like the technique that landed Ukraine's now deposed president, Viktor Yanukovych, a Nobel Peace Prize nomination. He was put forward in an op-ed in a Kiev paper written by Antony Salvia, a consultant working for a think tank called the American Institute in Ukraine. That organization had close connections with the Washington-based public relations firm Venable, which had signed a contract to work with the Yanukovych government in 2003. 
The Kremlin and its American PR agency, Ketchum, use a similar approach. Readers see op-eds written by what look like third parties, academics, analysts, all in praise of the Russian government. The writers are, in fact, recruited by Ketchum. Two years ago, the United Arab Emirates hired the Kamstall Group in Washington as consultants. The firm worked on a media push against Qatar, which is at odds with many of its neighbors in the Gulf. Kamstall recruited American journalists to write about Qatar's alleged funding of Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood and ISIL in Syria and Iraq. Kamstall met with CNN, New York Times, Reuters and Washington Post, among others. The campaign was considered a success and the firm was paid millions of dollars. Qatar also has consultants. Portland Communications manages the country's public image from its base in London. In 2011, as uprisings were taking place across the Arab world, the government of Bahrain hired a DC company called Policy Impact Group. It created a so-called think tank, the Bahrain American Council, which placed glowing articles in Bahraini newspapers about the royal family. There's grassroots activism. This is the opposite. And so PR types call it astroturfing. I personally don't agree with those tactics. The, they consider them the dark arts because I think it's very short term. And I think when you're working on behalf of a government or a client, you want to have a very long term approach. And the best long term approach is authenticity. Because look how negative and how damaging it is that everybody knows about the tactics that they use. It's damaging to the client and it's a very short term approach and doesn't work in the long term. So I would advocate strongly against using those tactics. Now this is an argument which every government falls for because it sounds so logical. You're a PR agency, you go to a government and you say, look at the terrible image you've got. Nigeria's getting the world's attention now and sparking outrage. Just and the president says, yeah, it's terrible. I know my country is wonderful. How come these people don't know how wonderful we are? And the PR agencies show them the newspapers they say, look at all this negative coverage. That's where it's coming from. We're a PR agency. We can change that coverage so people will change their minds. And the logic seems absolutely impeccable. But unfortunately, it's based on two lies. The first lie is that the PR agency can change what the media says. They can't. And the second lie is that if they succeed, the media will change public opinion. It doesn't. However, as long as governments obsess over public opinion, the public relations side of the news business will remain a growth industry, with its dark arts, imaginary and ambiguous sources, and expert analysts. And news junkies should make a habit of reading between the bylines. More voices on the download now on the PR experts who are working their way into the way that certain news stories are covered. given the internal quarrels uh, between Gulf states and events taking place within the region uh, with the proliferation of extremist movements, we come to find that PR firms on the whole are in fact having a detrimental role and moreover they're actually doing a disservice to all parties involved. Finally, some breaking news from the world of music. Apparently, drummers are smarter than we thought. You've all heard the reputation. He's just the drummer. You can stick anybody back there. It'll sound OK. However, researchers at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm are among those to have tested drummers and found that they are generally more intelligent than their bandmates. And they have intrinsic problem-solving skills that are way above average. For instance, neither Shane Bang nor his friend Kevin Key could afford to buy drum sets when they were growing up. So they just took to banging out beats using pens and rulers on their school desks. Problem solved. And their viral video is now fast approaching one million hits on YouTube. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post.